Hello, my name is Alan Adams. I'm the Chief Structural Engineer for the RAM Group at Bentley Systems and the Product Manager for the RAM Structural System software. Today's presentation is on building drift, understanding and satisfying code requirements. If you heard the comment, the top of the structure deflected three feet, what would your reaction be? If the structure in question is the Burj Khalifa, you might find that tidbit of trivia amusing. In heavy winds, the Burj Khalifa does sway three feet each way at the top. For other structures, you might find that comment quite alarming. For a number of reasons, it is important that excessive drifts be avoided. One reason is to maintain the stability and integrity of the structure. Excessive drift can make the structure unstable, inducing considerable forces into the members, leading to collapse. The collapse of the Northridge parking structure was caused in part by the disintegration of the short columns at the ramps that weren't capable of maintaining their strength at the drifts to which they were subjected. Another purpose is to protect non-structural elements against damaging warping and, and unanticipated forces. Windows, door frames, mechanical units, and ceiling tiles are examples of elements that can be damaged or compromised by excessive drifts. There were also other factors that led to the glass wall failure, but wind drift, particularly rotation of the structure, played a large part in the failure of the glass curtain wall of the John Hancock Tower in Boston. The brown rectangles visible in the lower left picture were plywood sheets used to board up the windows until a problem could be rectified. Limiting drift is also important in order to avoid occupant discomfort. Excessive movement can lead to motion sickness or may result in disconcerting and to some alarming noises as the structure rocks back and forth. This is especially true for wind where the motion may persist for an extended period of time. A brief overview. Displacement is the distance a point deflects under the applied load. Drift is the difference between the displacement of a point on one story and the displacement of the same point on the story below. And drift ratio is the drift divided by the story height. Displacement and drift are often used interchangeably in casual conversation, but they are in fact different. Consider the opening slides regarding the three foot deflection. Three feet of displacement may or may not be a problem, but three feet of drift between adjacent stories would be catastrophic. Using the output from RAM frame, part of the RAM structural system as an example, here is a printout of the story displacements and drifts. At each level and for each load case, the lateral displacement is listed. In this case, displacement for this seismic load case is 1.75 inches. The story drift is obtained by subtracting the displacement of the level below from the displacement of the level being considered. In this case, the story drift at the roof is 1.75 minus 1.35, or 1.40 inches. And finally, the drift ratio is obtained by dividing the story drift by the story height. In this case, the story height is 13.5 feet, or 162 inches. So the drift ratio is 0.3987 divided by 162 equals 0 0.0025. Drifts due to the seismic loads and wind loads are very different. Cause, duration, and effects are very different. We will first turn our attention to seismic forces and the resulting drifts based on the requirements of the building codes, particularly ASCE 7. Although similar, there are differences in the way that seismic loads are calculated based on whether they are going to be used in the determination of member loads and member strengths or for structural drift calculations. ASCE 7 section 12.8 gives a procedure for calculating the seismic lateral forces on a building. It is based on a determination of the base shear which is then distributed among the stories. It is a function of the seismicity of the building site, the type of lateral system used by the building to resist the lateral forces, and the importance of the structure. To avoid unnecessarily large design forces, the base shear is limited to a maximum value as a function of the seismic characteristics of the site, the type of lateral system used by the building, the importance of the structure, and most notably, the fundamental period of the structure. And finally, there is a minimum value for which the structure must be designed, with a potentially greater minimum limit for structures located in areas of higher seismicity. The story forces computed in this way are used for both the design of the members for strength and in the determination of the story drifts. However, 
In the calculation of the base shear to be used in the investigation of drift, there is an exception indicating that equation 12.8-5 does not need to be considered. Equation 12.8-5 dictates that at least a minimum value of base shear be used. So with the exception, there is no minimum value unless dictated by the conditions of, equ of equation 12.8-6. This means that drift can potentially be investigated using story forces that are smaller than those used for the strength design of the members. Referring back to the requirements of the procedure, equations 12.8-3 and 12.8-4 give a cap on the magnitude of base shear that must be considered. It is not necessary to design for a base shear greater than the values given by these equations. And note that this is a function of the building period T. The code indicates that the period of the structure is to be determined from an analysis that considers the properties and characteristics of the members in the structure. Two common methodologies are Eigen analysis and Ritz vectors. These methodologies calculate the set of structural modes and periods from which the period associated with the fundamental mode for a given direction is used in these calculations. To prevent the use of an excessively large value of period, the code prescribes a limit. T must be less than or equal to Cu times Ta. Cu is given in table 12.8-1. Ta is the approximate fundamental period given by the simple equation 12.8-7. It is a function of the building height h sub n and the type of lateral resisting frames or walls in the structure such as still moment resisting frames, eccentrically braced frames, etc. These parameters are listed in table 12.8-2. The requirement to limit the magnitude of the building period this way is perhaps out of concern that the idealized structural analysis model does not capture the true stiffness of the structure. Non-structural elements can have a stiffening effect on the structure but those elements are generally not included in the structural analysis model used in the determination of the building periods. So note that since the design base shear is inversely proportional to the building period, requiring the use of a smaller or limited period results in a greater upper bound limit on the base shears. Using a longer period obtained by the structural analysis may result in smaller base shears. Limiting the period to a maximum of Tu times Ca may result in greater base shears. The code conservatively requires the use of the smaller period and hence the potential for greater base shears. In the computation of the base shear and the associated story forces used in the determination of the structural drifts, however, the code indicates that it is acceptable to use the calculated periods. It is not necessary to limit the period to CUTA. So whereas for strength calculations, T is limited to no greater than CUTA, there is no such limit on the period when determining the story forces for the drift calculations. Allowing the use of the larger T for drift results in a smaller value for equations 12.8-3 and 12.8-4. This gives a more favorable value of base shear because the cap on the base shear is a smaller value that doesn't need to be exceeded. So when calculating or generating the forces used in the design of the structure, in addition to the pertinent information on seismicity and on the building period, it is important to indicate what the forces are intended to be used for. In order to obtain the most economical solution, when investigating drift, those provisions and exceptions that we've discussed should be invoked for the determination of the story forces. Some engineers use the same story forces when investigating drift as when investigating member strengths. This may be conservative, possibly very conservative. And note that while it may be conservative to use the story forces defined for the member forces when checking drift, it is unconservative to use the story forces defined for drift when checking member strengths. For buildings with moment frames, my recommendation is to take advantage of the exceptions given for the calculation of story forces for drift, since drift will often control the member sizes, even though it takes a little more effort. On the other hand, since drift rarely controls in the design of shear walls and brace frames, it will probably not be necessary to create both sets of seismic load cases, and using the set of seismic load cases used for member forces to check drift is reasonable, since it's likely that even those more conservative drift values will be shown not to control the design of those members.
As we discussed earlier, drift is the difference in the deflections between two adjacent stories. Section 12.8.6 indicates where these drifts are to be measured. They are to be determined at the center of mass. When one floor varies from another, don't just use the displacements at the centers of mass for each story. Rather, use the displacement at the center of mass of a given story and the displacement at the point vertically below that on the next level down. Take this structure for example. Because of the change in floor plan at each level, the centers of mass are at different locations for each level. Here's an elevation view of that structure showing the location of the center of mass of each story. For the calculation of the drift at the roof, the displacement at the center of mass at the roof is determined, as well as the displacement at a point on the story below, directly below the roof center of mass. Similarly, the drift for the fourth floor is determined using the displacement at the center of mass at the fourth floor and the displacement at a point vertically below that at the third floor. Similarly, for the third floor, and the second floor. So for this building the drift was calculated at a different point for each level with that point corresponding to the center of mass for that level. Note that you should not merely use the displacements calculated at each story center of mass if those points do not vertically align. That is, for example, you should not calculate the drift at the roof by using the displacement at the center of mass at the roof and the displacement of the center of mass of the fourth floor. So when investigating the drifts, be certain to look at the correct location for the given story. For example, the center of mass of the roof is at 132 feet and 85.5 feet. So the values listed here are appropriate only for the roof level. However, note that from a practical standpoint, if the centers of mass are reasonably close, it may be acceptable to choose a single representative location when investigating all levels, especially if there is very little rotation of the structure. But technically, the code says to use the location of the center of mass of each level. Note that in this report obtained from RAMFRAME, these are the elastic displacement, drift, and drift ratio values, not the amplified values. We will discuss that more in detail later. For structures defined as having a torsional irregularity, or an extreme torsional irregularity, as measured by the difference in the drift at one end of the building versus the other, and characterized by significant rotation of the building under the design forces, the code requires that the drift be the worst measured at any point along any edge of the structure. That is, rather than using the drift at the centers of mass, you must use the drifts calculated at the extreme ends of the structure for these irregular structures. These values include the effect of the torsional rotation of the stories, not merely the lateral translation of the stories. So rather than calculating the drifts at the centers of mass of the stories, it is necessary to calculate the drifts at each of the several corners of the structure and design for the worst drift. Again, this requirement is only for those structures for which any floor or floors are defined as torsionally irregular per Table 12.3-1 and doesn't apply elsewise. To determine whether a structure is torsionally irregular, it is necessary to determine the drifts at each floor at the extreme ends of the building. If the drift at one end of the floor is greater than 1.2 times the average of the drifts at the two ends of the floor for any floor, the structure is type 1A torsionally irregular. If the drift at one end of the floor is greater than 1.4 times the average of the drifts at the two ends of the floor for any floor, the structure is type 1B extreme torsionally irregular. So with this model, for example, we look at the drift at opposite ends of the roof and calculate the average drift, which in this case is 0.3484 inches. The ratio of the worst drift, which is 0.4538 inches at the left end of the structure, divided by the average drift is 1.30. Since this is less than 1.4, it is not extreme torsionally irregular, but since it is greater than 1.2, this building is torsionally irregular. Note that in order to declare that a building is not torsionally irregular, you need to perform this calculation for each story and verify that in all cases the ratio of maximum to average is less than 1.2. If a building is found to be torsionally irregular, the effects of accidental torsion must be amplified. M sub TA is the accidental torsional moment from the 5% eccentricity required by section 12.8.4.2.
So this clause may result in the requirement that the story forces be applied at points with an eccentricity greater than the value of 5% of the floor plan dimension normally used. The purpose of this is to further amplify the torsional effects of structures that indicate that they are already prone to torsion. Remember, AX may be different at each level and in each direction. Rather than using the 5% eccentricity values, multiply them by the amplification value A sub X calculated for that level and direction. Be sure to use the correct amplification value for the given direction. Don't get them reversed. Let us now turn to a discussion of the design story drifts. Section 12.8.6 defines the design story drift as shown here. C sub D is the deflection amplification factor given in Table 12.2-1 and is dependent upon the type of force resisting system being used in the, in the structure. For example, for a special reinforced concrete shear wall system, the value C sub D is 5. For still special moment frames, it is 5.5. Delta sub XC is the elastic deflection. Note that for the reports that we've been looking at, the listed values are the elastic values. The displacements listed are delta sub XC. To get the amplified values of drift, multiply the listed values by C sub D over I sub E. The limits on drift are given in Table 12.12-1. Structures with a higher risk category have more stringent drift limits, and the more brittle structures, such as masonry shear wall structures, also have more stringent drift limits. Note that the table limits the overall drift as a function of story height, and further note that the coefficients on these limits are what we refer to as the drift ratio limits. So, for example, a typical drift limit is 0 0.025 times the story height. This means that the drift ratio limit is 0 0.025. It is convenient to work with the drift ratio limit because then you don't have to deal with different story heights. The drift limit has a story height term in it, but the drift ratio limit does not. It is the same for all stories regardless of the story height. So in this example, the elastic drift is 0 0.4498, so the amplified drift, delta, is 5.5 times 0 0.4498, or 2.47 inches. The design story drift ratio is CD times 0 0.0028, which equals 0 0.0154. And since this value is less than the drift ratio limit of 0 0.025, it is acceptable. Note that this approach requires that you multiply every drift ratio value by C sub D over I sub E so that you can compare it to the limit from table 12.12-1. Rather than amplifying all of the values listed for drift ratio, an alternative approach is to calculate the elastic drift ratio limit. This is done by taking the limit from table 12.12-1 and dividing that limit by C sub D over I sub E. For example, for a drift ratio limit of 0 0.025, the elastic drift ratio limit is 0 0.025 divided by 5.5 divided by 1 equals 0 0.0045. This limit can then be compared directly with all of the elastic drift ratios. 0 0.0018 is less than 0 0.0045. 0 0.0019 is less than 0 0.0045, etc. Note that if the type of structural system is different in the two directions, so that the values of C sub D are different in the two directions, you have to calculate two elastic drift ratio limits, one for each direction, and compare with the drift ratios in the corresponding direction. I want to briefly discuss P delta. Section 12.8.7 indicates a condition whereby it is not necessary to include P delta in your analysis, specifically when the stability coefficient is less than or equal to 0 0.10. The stability coefficient theta is given by equation 12.8-16. Just a side note, delta IE over CD in this equation is the elastic drift that we have seen in the reports. So the elastic drift delta sub XE can be used directly in this equation in the place of the delta I sub B e over C sub D terms.
Essentially, this equation means that if the p-delta moments are small compared to the moments due to the lateral forces, the p-delta effects can be ignored. Note that if the structure is very stiff, such that a large shear only produces a small displacement, theta will be small. When using the direct analysis method of AISC 360, consideration of p-delta is required. So even if the ASCE 7 stability coefficient indicates that p-delta does not need to be considered, AISC 360 still requires it. The inclusion of the p-delta effects in the design forces is necessary in order for the member capacities given by AISC 360 to be valid. With the software available today, my recommendation is to include p-delta in your analysis regardless of the stability coefficient. But let's go back to the stability coefficient. The code goes on to give a maximum allowable limit to the stability coefficient as indicated by equation 12.8-17. If the value of theta at any level exceeds this maximum value, the structure is considered to be potentially unstable and must be redesigned. The redesign means that additional stiffness is required by either increasing the member sizes or adding additional frames in order to reduce the story drift. If p-delta was included in the original analysis, there is some relaxation in the comparison of theta with the maximum allowable value of theta. This is in recognition of the fact that inclusion of the p-delta effects in the analysis help account for the stability, or lack thereof, of the structure. When p-delta is included in the analysis, the value of the stability coefficient to be compared against theta max is theta divided by 1 plus theta, rather than comparing theta max against theta. So in review, the stability coefficient theta is given by equation 12.8-16. Theta max is given by equation 12.8-17. When comparing theta with theta max, it is permitted to compare theta divided by 1 plus theta if p-delta effects were included in the analysis. In this example, since p-delta was included, it is permissible to use the modified stability coefficient. Since theta divided by 1 plus theta is greater than theta max at the third floor, this building must be redesigned or reconfigured by increasing the structural stiffness and reducing the drifts at the third floor. Note that if a building has an extreme torsional irregularity, it is more prone to failing this requirement and a possible and desired solution is to add stiffness in a way that reduces the torsion. So enough about seismic drift. Let's now turn our attention to wind drift. Wind load requirements are given in ASC 710 chapters 26 through 31. Unlike the seismic requirements, no distinction is made between the calculation of wind loads for member strength design and that of building drift. Furthermore, no limits on drift are listed. Different design offices use different limits. Some use a different designed wind for strength design than they do for drift analysis. Generally, lesser winds with the explanation that those are the winds that the occupant is more likely to experience regularly. And some use factor drifts, and some use unfactored drifts. So there are wide differences in the way that wind drifts are considered. Lacking specific code requirements, it is important that engineers consider the use of the structure and the likely result of failure to provide adequate resistance to the wind forces. Whereas seismic events are rare, wind is a much more common occurrence and is much more likely to be perceived negatively by an occupant. One item of note, when investigating wind drifts, it is customary to measure the drifts at the extreme ends of the building, such as at the building corners, rather than at the centers of mass. I want to direct your attention to something that is new in ASCE 7 in, res in response to all of the complaints about all of the wind load cases required by the code. In figure 27.4-8, case 1 is the full wind straight on. Case 2 is three quarter of the wind plus an applied torsional moment. Section 26.2 defines a building to be torsionally regular under wind load if the maximum displacement caused by case 2 is not greater than case 1. If the building has significant rotation whereby the displacement caused by three quarter of the wind plus the displacement at either end caused by the rotation of the diaphragm due to the applied torsional moment is greater than the displacement at that same point caused by the full wind load straight on for any story, the structure is defined to be torsionally irregular. The new Appendix D gives conditions whereby it is not necessary to consider cases 2 and 4 
when designing for wind forces. Buildings that are torsionally regular are exempt from the requirement to consider load cases 2 and 4. So buildings that are torsionally regular only need to be analyzed for load cases 1 and 3. When considering both axes and the plus and minus torsional conditions, this reduces the number of wind load cases from 12 to 4. Note that you have to run the case to load cases first to see if you need to run them or not, but it may be useful because once you've established that you don't need to run them, it makes subsequent design and redesign efforts simpler. So for example, in this report, W1 represents the wind load case 1 in the x direction, and W2 represents the wind load case 1 in the y direction. W3 through W6 represent the various permutations of case 2. Looking at the displacements for W1 in the x direction, in this case 0.8042 inches, we compare that with the displacements in the x direction for each of W3 through W6. Similarly, looking at the displacements for W2 in the y direction, in this case 0.1569 inches, we compare that with the displacements in the y direction for each of W3 through W6. At the roof, at this location on the diaphragm, case 1 results in larger displacements than case 2, indicating that it is torsionally regular. We have to repeat this for all levels for all of the points being considered, which are the extreme corners of the building. If at any level, at any point, one of the displacements for case 2 is greater than for case 1, the building is not torsionally regular. In this example, there is a location at the roof where the displacement in the y direction for a case 2 load case 0.2002 inches for W5 is greater than, than the displacement in the y direction for the case 1 load case 0.1638 inches for W2. So this structure is not torsionally regular so all of the wind load cases must be considered. And finally some discussion regarding the requirements in the direct analysis method of AISC 360 to use reduced stiffnesses in the analysis of steel structures. In this methodology, the stiffness of all members is reduced by a factor of 0.8 or 0.8 times tau sub b. Notice, however, that the specification explicitly says that this is required when determining the required strengths of members. It is important to note that it is not required in the analysis used in the determination of drift and other serviceability requirements. The AISC Stability Committee responsible for the direct analysis method did not intend that those stiffness reductions be applied to the analysis when investigating serviceability such as drift or in the determination of the periods, base shares, etc. They only intended that those stiffnesses be used in the analysis used to determine the member and component design loads. Using the reduced stiffnesses in a drift analysis may be either conservative or unconservative. Less stiffness means larger drifts, which is conservative, but less stiffness means that the calculated period is longer, which may result in a smaller base shear, which means smaller story forces, which means smaller drifts. This is unconservative. When using the direct analysis method, my recommendation is to run the analysis twice, once to determine the periods, applied loads, and drifts, without the reduced stiffnesses, and then again for the member design with the reduced stiffnesses. Be sure to use the periods obtained from the first analysis if you are having your computer program automatically calculate the seismic wind forces in the second analysis. In the limited time that I have had, I have tried to give a broad overview of drift and code requirements related to wind and seismic drift. Hopefully some of the things that I have said will help you be more productive as you analyze and design buildings particularly in relationship to drift requirements. It is important that you study carefully the code requirements as there were several details that I did not have time to discuss. Without the proper tools, determining the impact and extent of the drifts can be tedious and time consuming. Furthermore, once you have identified that the structure has problems with drift, it can be difficult determining how best to provide the necessary stiffness to control those drifts. That process often becomes trial and error to see what works. With this approach, it is difficult to work productively and achieve an economical structure. For the next few minutes, I will demonstrate a powerful tool 
that can assist you in the process of refining your structural model to meet the demands of the drift requirements. In the material I presented previously, there were several examples using reports that were produced by RAMFRAME. RAMFRAME is the lateral analysis and design module, a part of the RAM structural system software. RAMFRAME has many powerful analysis and reporting features for the design of frames and shear walls. In addition to the reports that you saw in my presentation, one particularly powerful feature is the drift module. Based on the virtual work methodology, this module can be used to identify those parts of the structure most influential in controlling drift. It identifies which members would be the most effective in reducing lateral drift by increasing their stiffness. It identifies the sensitivity that, is, that the stiffness of a given member has in influencing the overall drift. It can even be used to identify which members can use reduced sizes without significantly adding to the drift. The module even identifies what component of stiffness, axial, flexural, or shear for example, that is the component most effective in stiffening the structure. This identifies whether, for example, a size is needed with a larger area, as is the case when the axial shortening of the column is a major contributor to the structural drift, or a size is needed with a larger moment of inertia. Using this powerful tool in RAM frame can help you quickly identify how best to stiffen the structure to satisfy the requirements related to drift. I will now give you a demonstration of RAM frame, in particular the drift control module in RAM frame. Let's consider this four-story building. Notice on the right that the floors step back at each level. As a result of this, the center of mass for each level changes, and those are the points at which we need to investigate drift. The lateral system consists of moment frames in the longitudinal direction and shear walls and a brace frame in the transverse direction. This structure has been sized to meet the requirements of the still provisions of AISC 360. They've also been checked for the requirements of the AISC 341 seismic provisions. Now that this structure has met the requirements for strength, let's direct our attention now to drift. First thing we need to do here is to change the criteria so that it does not include the reduced stiffness required for the direct analysis method for AISC 360. As we discussed earlier, that is not required as part of the drift analysis. We will also now analyze the structure for the gravity loads, the seismic drift load cases, but not the seismic strength load cases, not the notional loads, as they're not necessary in consideration of drift, but we will include the 12 wind load cases. Let's now take a look at the results of the drift analysis. For this analysis, I've set up eight control points. The first control point is the center of mass at the roof. So this is the point at which we will investigate drift for the roof. The second is the center of mass for the fourth floor. The third is the center of mass for the third floor. And the fourth line here is the center of mass for the second floor. Then in addition to that, I've included four points that represent the four extreme corners of the model so that we can get the points both at the center of mass as indicated in the first four values and at the extreme corners as represented by the second set of four values. And let's now take a look at the results. So we see a list here of the load cases for which we're getting results and so we see at this location which is the center of mass at the roof the results for the roof for each of the load cases. Now to make this a little clearer at this point, I'm going to limit the amount of output and let's first of all examine just the dead load and live load and roof load cases. So I'll turn these others off so that they're not part of the report and once again we will take a look at the report. So now seeing the drift for the dead live and roof loads at this location, which is the center of mass at the roof, we see the results for the roof, and we see that the story drifts are rather insignificant. What this indicates to us is that 
going for, forward, we don't need to worry about considering the dead and live load drifts because they're inconsequential and that will ease our task at looking at the drifts that truly are important. Next, let's take a look at the wind load cases. And we pull up the same report. So here now we see the results of drift for the wind load cases. Now in the case of the wind, we're not concerned about the drift at the center of mass, but rather the drift at the extreme points of the structure. So if we scroll down to one of those points, we can take a look at the results. So at the 0, 0 location in the structure, here is the list of each of the wind load cases at the roof with the story drift and the drift ratio. A common limit on wind drift is h over 500 which translates into a drift ratio of 0 0.002 and so we see that at the worst case here at the roof we've satisfied that limit that drift limitation at the fourth floor we're right at that 0 0.002 limitation uh, at the third floor we've si slightly exceeded that and so we see that again at the third floor we need to do some stiffening so that we can satisfy our wind drift requirement of H over 500. And finally let's take a look at the seismic drift cases. So I will select those cases for the report and turn off the wind cases. Once again we're interested in the drift at the center of mass. So for the roof we see drift ratios of 0042. Keep in mind that the drift limit for this structure is 0.025 times the story height or a drift ratio of 0.025. So we could take these numbers and multiply C sub D which is 5.5 or more conveniently as we discussed we can take the drift limit of 0.025 divide by C sub D and the resulting value is 0 0.0045. So our elastic drift ratio limit for each level is 0 0.0045. So here we see at the roof level we've satisfied that requirement. Let's now take a look at the center of mass for the fourth floor. And here we see that we've exceeded the allowable limit of 0 0.0045. Uh, at the fourth floor we have a value of 0 0.0053. The next location is the center of mass for the third floor. That has a drift ratio of 0 0.0054. So once again we can see that we need to, to stiffen up the structure in order to satisfy the, the drift ratio limits at the third floor. And then finally we look at the center of mass at the second floor and the values of drift at that level are 0 0.0033. So the, the second story drift are acceptable. One other thing that I want to point out at this point is the small values of drift ratio in the y direction. We easily meet the requirements of the drift ratio to help us identify how best to go about stiffening up the structure. We're going to use the drift control module in RAMFRAME. And to do that, I need to create two new load cases. The drift control module is based on the virtual work principle, and so we need to create two virtual work load cases to help us with our effort here. So the first virtual load case that I'm going to create, I'm going to call V fourth because this is the virtual load case that we're going to use to help us identify what to do with the stiffening at the fourth floor. And to do that, I will identify a nominal force in the x direction, or zero degrees, to be applied at the center of mass. And then similarly, for the third floor, I'll create a V third virtual workload case with a nominal load at the third level applied at the third story center of mass. And now we perform the analysis. At this point we will only be considering the seismic drifts since they were so much more critical than the wind drifts. 
and then at the conclusion we can just verify that the wind load drift requirements were also satisfied based on the stiffening that we've added. So we analyzed the structure for the gravity loads, the seismic drift loads, and the virtual load cases, and then we proceed into the drift control module. And what we need to do now is to pair up real load cases with these virtual load cases. So I'm going to call this first one the V fourth pair. The uh, factor can be 1.0. The real load case is that seismic load case in the X direction and the virtual load case is V1 which is the virtual load case relevant to the fourth floor. I'm going to do the same thing for for the third floor pair again a factor of one. The real load case again is seismic load E1 and now the virtual load case is V2 which is the one that's appropriate for the third floor. I've created two virtual load cases. To be complete I'd create two more in order to include the X direction minus eccentricity drift load case but for our purposes here we'll investigate these two. I analyze the structure and we look at the results. The members in red indicate that they have the greatest influence on the drift at the fourth floor because we're looking at this V fourth pair. We're looking at the virtual work results for the fourth level. Something that's of even more interest is the total displacement per volume. This indicates the sensitivity of the members considering their size as well as their participation in influencing the drift once again at the fourth floor. So what this indicates is that in order to reduce the drifts at the fourth floor we will be most effective in increasing the stiffness of the beams at the third floor. Similarly if we look at the V third pair virtual work results we find that in order to reduce the drift at the third floor the most effective thing will be to increase the stiffness of the beams and columns at the lowest level. Now the question comes up if we increase the stiffness of the columns should we look at increasing the area of the column or should we consider increasing the moment of inertia? In the case of a taller structure the drift is often influenced strongly by the elastic shortening of the column. So in those cases the solution is to select column sizes with a larger area. In other cases the drift is strongly influenced by the moment of inertia. In order for us to discern what which is the case for this model we can go ahead and view the member directly and what we see is currently we have a W24 by 146. The displacement participation factors are the key here. It lists the factors for the axial, shear, flexural, joint, and connection components of this column. And we see that the flexural participation factor is the dominant one. What that indicates to us is that the best way to stiffen up this member is to increase the moment of inertia or the flexural stiffness. On the other hand, for that structure where the axial shortening is more of an, of an issue, the axial participation may have been the dominant one, indicating that in order to reduce the deflections, what we would want to do is increase the area of the column, you know, not necessarily the eye of the column. So in this case, it indicates that we want to increase the flexural stiffness of the, of the column, and we're already using W24s, so what we will do is we will proceed to use heavier W24 columns. First of all, let's change, let's assign new sizes to the lowest level of columns. And we could make the assignment just to the lowest level, but in order to ease construction and avoid a, uh, a splice at the first level, we'll assign the larger size to the first two levels of columns. The next larger size is a W24 by 162, so let's make that assignment.
and on the interior columns that are W24 by 176, let's change those to W24 by 192. In addition, let's make the changes to the beam sizes. And what we see is that the next size up is the W24 by 104, and above that is the W24 by 117. It's important to note that those two sizes will not pass the seismic requirements for the width thickness ratios. So we will skip those sizes, and the next available size that would pass those requirements is the W24 by 131. So let's make those assignments at these at these lowest level beams. Now that we've made those assignments, let's go back and reanalyze the structure and determine what further action is required to control these drifts. So we analyze our cases again. Invoke the drift at a point command. And looking at the results at the center of mass for the roof, we see that the roof drift ratios are at 0 .0041, uh, again, in the acceptable range. At the fourth floor, center of mass, we look at those results, and we're still overdrifted, 0 .0051, which shouldn't be a surprise because we didn't, we didn't focus on making the changes to take care of the fourth floor drifts. What we did is we made the changes trying to reduce the third floor drift. So let's take a look at that location for the third floor. And what we find now is that our drift ratio is at 0 .0047. So we made significant improvement. We have very nearly meet, reached our target of 0 .0045. And then finally, we look at the results for the second floor center of mass and the drift ratio is at 0 .0028, so well within our limit. Let's once again proceed into the drift control module, analyze our two virtual work load pairs, and here are the results. So to reduce the drift at the fourth floor, these beams highlighted in red and orange are those beams that will have the most impact on reducing that drift. And if we look at the third floor, once again, we see some columns, but mostly the second and third floor beams. Previously, we worked on the third floor pair. Let's take a look at the fourth floor and do what we can here to stiffen up the fourth floor and see what impact that has on the overall result. So to reduce the drift at the fourth floor, the virtual work results are indicating that we should increase the stiffness of the beams at the third floor. Currently, they're W24 by 103. Let's go ahead and make an assignment here and simply increase the beams at those levels to the W24 by 131 size that we made at the bottom level. Once again, we return to the analysis mode. We analyze our cases for simplicity. Let's turn off the Y direction drift. And we look at the results. Looking at the roof, our drift ratio is 0 .0039 within the acceptable limits. At the fourth floor, we are very nearly at our drift limit of 0045. At the center of mass of the third floor, we look at the third floor results, and we're now at 0042. So we've now met the drift requirements at the third floor. And finally, we look at the second floor, and of course, it's within the drift limits as expected. So what we see now is that we've satisfied the drift requirements for seismic, except at the fourth floor, where we need to make some minor adjustments in order to meet that drift ratio requirement. So once again, we go back into the drift control module, perform the analysis on those load pairs. And we take a look at this fourth floor pair, and it identifies that we need to most effectively increase the stiffness of the third floor beams. So we've all already increased the size of those beams, and if we continue to increase the size, then we run the risk of having beams that are stronger than the columns in the seismic checks. So 
let's examine the possibility of increasing the stiffness of the fourth floor beams and consider the effect effectiveness of doing that. And as we look at those fourth floor beams, we see that they're colored with the yellow color, which means we'll still have moderate impact in the drift by changing the stiffness of those members. If we change the stiffness of the members, say, at the roof level, their, their impact would be minor at best. So to be truly most effective, we would increase the size of the beams at the third floor, but because of other considerations, we're going to choose to increase the size of the beams at the fourth floor instead. Let's go ahead and increase those sizes to W24 by 84 at each of these locations. Once again, we return to analysis mode, perform the analysis, and look at the drift results. Now we see at the roof level, our drifts are 0037. At the center of mass appropriate for the fourth floor, we see that our drifts are at 0045, right at the limit. At the center of mass of the third floor, we see that our drifts are at 0042. And at the lowest level, our drifts are at 0027. We've now met the drift requirements for the seismic load cases. At this point, we could reanalyze all of the load cases, investigate and verify the wind drift and the seismic drift, which we've already done. We could investigate the ASCE 7 stability coefficient. We would take a look and make sure that we still pass all of the seismic code checks, uh, in particular column stronger than beam. But at this point, we have satisfied the requirements for seismic drift and most certainly for wind drift. So any additional increases in member sizes, if necessary due to those other requirements, will reduce the drifts even more. So as you can see, the drift module helped us quickly determine the sizes we needed for drift. Hopefully the material presented and the program demonstration were helpful. The requirements associated with drift are substantial and the work involved can be tedious and time consuming. The proper software can provide great assistance in that effort. Feel free to contact us with questions or concerns. Of special note, see the link to Bentley Communities. This is an online resource where questions can be posted and answers obtained, as well as technical resources accessed on a wide variety of technical topics. Take a look and see what you find there that might help you in your job as a structural engineer. I appreciate your attendance and attention during this presentation. Thank you.